<laughs> Sorry, fellas. Well, here they are. A real hot act to have come to us from a successful tour of the breakfast circuit. Those breakfast buddies, ham and eggs. As you board, please move across your car to make room for everyone and kindly offer available seating to those needing special assistance. Oh boy, the studio backstage tour! <laughs> Let's give the little birdies a great big hand. Oui. Applaud, applaud. Yeah, you down there. Make both hands. W, w Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 531. I'm here once again not only to help you have the best possible vacation experience, but I also want to bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are, not just with this podcast, but with my videos, live broadcasts on Facebook every Wednesday night, books, audio tours, special events, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com and be part of the community by going to www.radio.com slash community. So did you know that at one time, Disney had planned to build not just a shopping village, but an entire residential community in Walt Disney World. I don't mean Golden Oak, but from townhouses to apartments to single family homes and even a retirement community, this abandoned idea led to the creation of the Disney Institute. And here, guests would stay, play, and more importantly, learn from Disney in dozens of areas, including animation, culinary, gardening, photography, television, and more. And this week, we're going to travel aboard my Walt Disney World Wayback Machine to discover how the idea of this Lake Buena Vista Village community became a learning center, thanks to Michael Eisner. We'll talk about the courses and the programs, why it didn't succeed, and how it became what is now Disney Saratoga Springs Resort and the current incarnation of a very different Disney Institute. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, and I'll introduce a new way for you to enter to win a very special prize package, no trivia knowledge required. Then stay tuned to the end of the show. I'll have more information about upcoming WW Radio events, Meet to the Month, your voicemails, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. Tells me I'm gonna remember this vacation. <laughs> There's a new kind of vacation at the Walt Disney World Resort in Florida. It's a vacation that immerses you in a special world where you can try new things, where you can explore and discover at a resort destination unlike anything you have ever experienced. You won't believe what you can do. Today, when you hear the words Disney Institute, you may either be unfamiliar with the term or know of it as the professional development and business consulting division of the Disney Parks and Resorts, and where they sort of based on the best practices of the Parks and Resorts in, here in Walt Disney World and throughout the Disney Company, the Institute offers courses that help individuals and organizations from professional development to leadership service culture, and a lot more. But if we turn back the clock to 1996 or so, Disney Institute meant something completely different. And this week, we're going to do just that. We are going to turn back the clock and climb aboard my Walt Disney World Wayback Machine and visit the original Disney Institute. The name might be the same, but everything else was quite different. And joining me this week is someone who not only knows the Disney Institute inside and out, he lived it. My friend, author, raconteur, and former Disney Institute cast member, Jim Corcus. Welcome back, buddy. Hey, Lou, thank you so much for in inviting me back. I, I love your show. I love uh, uh, the listeners. I, I hope we'll be able to give them uh, a 
wider perspective and greater insight into uh, uh, the Disney Institute because it really was a uh, uh, once upon a time uh, uh, fairy tale, but unfortunately it was one where they didn't live happily uh, uh, ever after. <laughs> and uh, as as you alluded to, yes, I was uh, part of the opening uh, uh, crew. I was uh, uh, a, a salaried animation instructor at, at the Disney uh, Institute, and I taught every single animation program um, uh, at the uh, uh, Institute, and I was also cross-trained and loaned out uh, to other program uh, uh, tracks, including um, uh, story arts and uh, uh, video production and all that, because, uh, again, I have a, a diverse uh, uh, background, so I can provide that uh, insight. And as we were talking uh, off mic, uh, there really is very little information out there about uh, Disney Institute as that physical uh, location for um, uh, guest enrichment uh, uh, classes, and some of the information out there is uh, uh, misleading or inaccurate simply because from the moment go, from the moment it opened in February 96, changes were immediately <laughs> happening, and it, and it wasn't just, you know, um, oh yes, well, there's going to have to be some uh, adjustments, just like on any attraction or, or new theme park or, or whatever, it actually started and it was a domino effect where things were just constantly changing, so you, you couldn't keep uh, uh, track of things. But, but you know, uh, it, it's, it's interesting, even though the Disney Institute's on the, the physical location where uh, uh, Saratoga Springs Resort and Spa is today, that really wasn't the beginning of the story, right? Yeah, and I actually, I, for me, Jim, I think the story of Disney Institute begins even earlier than the early 70s and, and right after Walt Disney World came to be. I think if we look at the history of this concept, I believe it goes back to Walt itself. And, and go with me here in terms of what, it, I don't mean that Walt spoke of the concept of a learning institution on theme park property, but I sort of uh, um, no, a but, he, but he but he thought about a learning institution where you could sample a variety of different disciplines. That 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 was the whole philosophy behind uh, California Institute of the Arts. Is that oh, you're going there because you want to be an animator, but we're going to make you take classes in in dance and in architecture and and all of that because that's going to enrich you. Uh, as an animator. And so, yeah, I, I think Walt's earliest uh, educational philosophy is um, that you should get the broadest educational perspective that you can, that you should be allowed uh, to sample, you know, different things, because that, that's going to add to your, um, uh, whatever your primary major discipline is, is going to be. Well, I even mean I, I also mean in terms of of the Disney parks themselves. So, when he had these visions of what Walt Disney World was going to be, I I sort of think about his concept of Epcot. Right, he wanted this planned community where people would live and work and play and learn in a city that would ma uh, act as, as a model for others and showcase technology and for a la for some mm -hmm. people allow them to live in Walt Disney World. And when Walt passed in 1966, not everybody uh, agreed with the idea or more importantly, they didn't know how to execute on it or what the details of his vision were. But I think that they realized very early on that they had that that blessing of size and lots of land to work with. And I think that is sort of what was the, the very early beginning. So look, I think before we even get to Disney Institute and then Saratoga Springs, we have to go back to the early 70s in terms of what this area, what this property was originally going to be. And in 1972, literally months after the park opens, the Walt Disney Company forms the, the Buena Vista Land Company to plan and develop areas outside 
the park. And the first thing that they announce is the Lake Buena Vista Village, which you may or may not know is now Disney Springs, which they announced in June seven uh, of 73. So they wanted to have this 1,200-acre community near what was called the Motor Inn Plaza, which is now Hotel Plaza Boulevard, right near Disney Springs. And this village was going to be divided into four different themed areas, golf, tennis, boating, and western. Interesting choices. <laughs> but they were going to have a shopping village and a pro golfer designed golf course and a variety of different homes from townhouses to single family and small cluster homes. And this Lake Buena Vista community company was going to build these single family homes and then apartments and condos in the in, not long after that. And what they thought they would do was they would sell these or even lease these out as business retreats and vacation properties. Uh, they only built four of the single family homes as part of phase one as sort of model homes. And then what businesses can do is they could come in and sort of custom design the home that they want built at as part of phase two. And they were also going to build 900 uh, apartments for the cast members who were working at Disney. By May of 74, they have about 133 townhouses built. The Lake Buena Vista Village is being constructed next door. And then they were going to start to work on... And, and they also had 60 treehouse villas at the same time that they had built. Right. because they, they just they, never got around to the apartments and single-family homes. They had even thought about a, a retirement community and, and all the... So, but in, in, in March of 75, late March, March 22nd, there's 32 shops and restaurants, 133 townhouses, 60 treehouse tree villas, which... Again, sort of this idea of, of showcasing energy-efficient homes and green spaces and things like that. They didn't start on any of the apartment buildings or single-family homes because at some point, somebody walks in on a Monday morning and goes, you know, if we let people live here, they're going to be allowed to vote, not just on what's going on in their community, but on Walt Disney World construction projects. So they pumped the brakes very, very quickly and decided in instead not to sell them, but to rent them as um, vacation homes and resort rooms. But because they were going to be homes, Jim, they had kitchens, etc., like DVC resorts. But that's why today places like Golden Oak and Celebration were de-annexed from Walt Disney World so they wouldn't run into the same problems. Well, and, you know, to, to tie into what you said uh, earlier, uh, Walt's uh, original concept of uh, uh, Epcot was uh, people uh, could only rent uh, uh, where, they, where they were living. They could not uh, own because, again, that would have been that uh, same problem of, you know, then they would have the opportunity to, to vote, and Walt certainly didn't want people and anybody out voting what he wanted uh, uh, done over there. And, and it wasn't just voting. Uh, it, there was also the issue, and this gets much more complicated, about uh, taxation. Yeah. So that if you have people in that area, how do you handle the taxation? And, and even though, uh, you know, Reedy Creek um, Improvement District was given, you know, uh, wide uh, authority on, on these things, it, it still becomes a mess and so it's less of a mess to just say look we already have you know resorts that we're running this will just be uh you know a, another uh resort it'll be the village resort you know the disney village resort so yeah and and there were it's funny that she sort of uh, paused a little bit when you called it because the, there was uh, like a million name changes for all yeah. the different types of houses so and Jim, I remember coming down here in the, the mid '80s and seeing these and staying in these. You're with that my, old? Uh, okay, go I ahead. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so what they did was they you built, sound so young. I know. You look so young. Okay, it's, go ahead. I moisturize a lot. Um, so <laughs> they built these uh, little villas, these little sort of condos around these courtyards and cul-de-sacs again for green spaces and things like that, and then they were transformed into a hotel resort, and they also built the Walt Disney World Conference Center. Right? They still wanted to get those businesses in there. So mm -hmm. it opens up in 85 as the Village Resort. And then in 
four years later, they changed the name to the Disney Village Resort. And the Lake Buena Vista Village Shopping Center, also they want to make sure that they that guests understand it is a Disney property. They changed that to the Walt Disney World Village, which later becomes mm-hmm. Downtown Disney and Pleasure Island. It actually was the marketplace area of Disney Springs. But there was a lot of different types of villas to actually choose from. So they had vacation villas, which were one and two bedroom, like I said, condos. They actually, mm-hmm. they renamed them townhomes later on when they when it became the Disney Institute. There were fairway villas that were open from like 78 to 2001, 2002. Those were two bedroom that were very energy efficient. They overlooked the golf course. They were built on these 10 foot high pedestals to withstand the flooding and for natural drainage. They closed them in 2002. They start using them, lucky people, for the International College Program cast members for, uh, from like 2005 to 2008. And then they have, those two eventually get um, uh, folded into Saratoga Str- Springs. There's the three-bedroom treehouse villas, which are also, the, again, the, the, on top of the pedestals. And they also had these Club Lake villas, which are also known as the Club Suites, that were added much later on, like mid-1980s or so. And these were the ones that were meant to appeal to the conventioners and the businesses who were coming to the conference sw- center. They become the Club Suites in 89, and there's they're, they're not as big, but they have two queen-size beds, there's a separate sitting and sort of workspace area. Then they were renamed the Bungalows when it was re- remodeled as the Disney Institute. And then finally, they had only four of those single-family dwellings that they called the Grand Vista Suites. And I want to say that's where I stayed with my family. We had brought some cousins down, but it might have just been wishful thinking. But those were sort of like the model homes. And then obviously everything becomes part of Disney Institute as, as we get to there in 1996. Well, and, and you probably did stay there uh, simply because uh, of the number of people in your party. So, you know, that, that would have been the largest, you know, uh, uh, place, you know, that that could house that number of people. I, and I'm sure at this particular point, you've, you've got listeners to this program going, what? <laughs> they never heard about any of this stuff. Because Disney is is constantly uh, uh, changing, constantly morphing. And, and again, a lot of this stuff is just simply not documented, not, not written uh, down uh, anywhere. And, and off mic, before we began, we, uh, we were talking, I, I was grumbling about the fact that, you know, so much is happening at the uh, uh, parks at Walt Disney World and uh, the, uh, the roadways getting into the parks and, and the parking and, and all of that, that I don't know if I could ever be considered an, an, a, a Walt Disney World expert anymore because, you know, the, the, the Walt Disney World that I knew and uh, knew like the back of my hand now, you know, is, is almost completely changed. But, you know, we'll, we'll go with that. But, uh, yeah, so, so you have this little area out there on, on the side. And, and, again, the whole, the whole point of that is you want to try and, and the point of having the uh, shopping village there, which uh, also started to expand. It was originally just to, to, to take care of, you know, the village uh, resort, but it actually uh, – uh, expanded uh, to take care of all Walt Disney World uh, guests, and in fact, uh, in the ticket books, they they would give a uh, a free transportation round trip transportation ticket, so you could take transportation Disney transportation to to see uh, the Village uh, uh, Shopping uh, uh, Center. There is they wanted to keep people on property instead of going, you know, somewhere else, but. You know, like at the Magic Kingdom, you know, uh, uh, once the park closed, that was it. There's no right. nightlife. You, you know, there may be something happening at the Contemporary at the top of the world there. But basically, you know, and, and where do you go if you want to, you know, get a, a gallon of milk or, or whatever? And and I think a lot of people don't realize, uh, too, that that whole crossroads section there, uh, Disney owned all of that land there, you know, at one time. And eventually sold it off. 
and now that's going to go. Right. Uh, right. And end of this year, beginning in next, I guess they're going to bulldoze all of that uh, down. You know, to to have another uh, off ramp and a flyover and wider lanes and and things like that. And so crossroads, you know. I don't know where all those businesses are going to go, but uh, uh, th- those who go, oh yes, I remember as a kid going down there, and we used to to go to the you know supermarket there and, right. and get yeah. Mountain Dew or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, not happening anymore. Well, but that, you know, but, you I, know think, while, I think while it, all of this is going on, you know, Michael Eisner becomes CEO in 1984, and he takes a look at Disney property, and he's going, you know. Look at all this land we've got here. We need to, you know, monetize it. We need to utilize it, and and especially one of the uh, 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 big challenges we we don't have anything to accommodate large convention groups, you know, and and that's what led to, you know, the building of, uh, of uh, the Swan and Dolphin Resorts was to have, you know, on Disney property something that could uh, accommodate, you know, large convention groups. But uh, in 85, Eisner takes his family to the Chautauqua Institution in upstate New York. And uh, I'm sure some of the listeners ha- have been there. And it's a, it, it takes place just during the summer. And there's lectures and there's performances and there's recreation and there's uh, classes designed for adults to, you know, enrich their uh, e- education there. You know, it, it, it's a wonderful thing of, well, we're not just going out to take, you know, a, a, a picture of uh, the Washington Monument or the Grand Canyon or whatever, we're actually doing something, you know, to uh, energize our minds, energize ourselves, you know, uh, uh, before we go back. And, and in fact, that 1985, that was around the time where uh, those type of enrichment vacations were becoming uh, uh, popular, like uh, eco-travel where people could combine, you know, a nature experience with, you know, lessons on the uh, environment there. And so, um, obviously, Chautauqua Institution, that's where you get institute from, right? Um, And at one time, actually, Eisner was going to call it, you know, the Disney Institution. But anyway, uh, Eisner takes a look and he goes, hey, you know, this is a great idea, and this would be a great way uh, for people to uh, extend their vacation stay at, um, you know, uh, the Walt Disney World Resort, because it's not like we're getting all of their money. We're just getting most of their money. And also, uh, if we had something like this, we could attract in a whole new demographic, right. you know, that that really isn't interested in the Walt Disney World theme. And I know this is going to be hard for the listeners to hear, uh, but I have actually run into these people who don't care about going <laughs> to a Disney theme park. You don't you know? talk to that. You don't talk to those people anymore, do you? Oh, no, no <laughs> they're dead to me. They're dead to me. No, I, I actually, I have a, a good friend named uh, Kim, and she she is just a Disney fanatic, and she comes down from um, Illinois, and she loves hitting the parks. But she comes down with her husband, and her husband can't stand it. Right. You know he. He can barely be in the park for an hour or two before he goes, are we almost finished? Whereas Kim wants to go there, you know, from early morning hours until, you know, extended evening hours, you know, all which of that. Is, so, which is uh, why so, the idea uh, of Disney uh, Institute uh, makes sense. Rick actually goes off and does golfing or sits by the pool or whatever and says, you know, this is how we're going to keep the marriage happy. But anyway, Eisner felt, you know, there are a lot of people who don't come here, you know, because it's like, Oh, that's kitty stuff or whatever. And so, my gosh, if if we have this opportunity, you know, uh, and we have all these different types of offerings, uh, that would increase, you know, that that opportunity. Um, although originally Eisner's plan for the Disney Institute was it was going to be built in Aspen, Colorado, because he felt. Uh, you know that was far away from the the Disney theme park, so you could establish it as, you know, very prestigious and exclusive and educational and and more importantly, people who go to Aspen, these are well off people. These are rich people who have a lot of discretionary income, and uh, will 
grab some of that. But but again, when the cost figures came back, it was just very, very pricey. And so his next uh, idea was, we're going to build it in celebration. Because, you know, this will also bring prestige to the celebration project. You know, uh, originally uh, the offices for uh, Disney Institute and where I auditioned for my teaching position were there in celebration because they were going to build it, you know, there. And again, they take a look at the cost and they go, this is a lot of money, you know. And so it was decided, okay, do we have anything that's existing on Disney property that we only have to do a little bit of building? (laughs) And my gosh, they took a look at the Lake Buena Vista uh, uh, residential community and they go, Look at that. They got villas, they got townhouses, they got, you know, they've got some structures already in existence. You know, we build a couple of classrooms, we build a cinema. Hey, you know, uh, they, this, this is going to save us a, a couple of bucks. And uh, I, I know people hate to, to say this uh, or hear it, uh, but basically, a lot of Disney's decisions are based on money. How much money is this going to cost? If we invest this amount of money, how much money is going to be returned, you know, uh, uh, from, do, from doing this? And, uh, you know, and again, like a lot of uh, Eisner projects, this simmered for, for a bit. It didn't, you know, uh, jump in immediately. Actually, program planning, I know for a fact, uh, started uh, as early as 1993, where they were uh, designing, you know, what are going to be the different program tracks, uh, what are going to be the possible classes in each of those program tracks. But the actual physical construction at the site uh, didn't begin until uh, early in uh, 1995, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, to make it look like this... Uh, a small, friendly New England town, you know. Um, and I remember when he um, when he announced, you know, and this is something that I know you have a, a story to share that's going to touch on this in, in a little bit, was you, you talked about the money and the investment and things like that. And yes, they were saving money by repurposing existing buildings uh, and, and the, the villas behind the townhouses, but this was no small investment. You know, this was a, a $35 million investment in the, the company that they were taking a chance on. And when he announced the project in March of, of 95 at Carnegie Hall, by the way, he mm-hmm. even said, um, he said, we're not calling it education. It's a new type of, of vacation fund. But Mickey and Minnie and their friends are not going to take any part in this program like I know that he might not like it, but this this is going to be the way it is. This is something for those individual adults or those families, maybe with older kids, 10, 12 or older, um, you know, and the younger kids, their time obviously was is best spent in Magic Kingdom. But for the older kids and the adults, this is going to be sort of a, a different type of a playground for them. And And you're right. 10 years old was the absolute cutoff. They, they uh, couldn't be any younger than 10 to, you know, uh, attend. And there were youth programs. There was a whole youth programming track uh, for kids 10 to uh, about uh, 16. But, but yeah, they, uh, and, and again, even though this was a pricey project, if he had built in Aspen or even if he had built in Celebration, uh, it could have been three times that amount, you know, or, or, or more, you know. And, and, again, repurposing something, it was part of the um, Disney tradition, which which often got uh, the Disney company uh, uh, into trouble, because you know the the whole point was okay, we're going to close this ride, but instead of just tearing down the entire building, is we're going to repurpose this ride, you know, to a different uh, uh, ride, you know, and so. Um, We've got the World of Motion building, and instead of tearing down the World of Motion building, we're going to try and shoehorn in text, test track, you know, into that. And so now you're creating all sorts of problems because the building may not 
be able to easily accommodate, you know, the, the, the track or the new technology or, or whatever. But it's like, look, we're, we're, we're saving things. We're not tearing down the entire building. Well, it would have made more sense to tear down the entire building and then just, you know, build a brand new building that, that was purposed uh, uh, for that. You know, we're, we're doing that to, to this day, right? Uh, uh, over, over at Epcot, you know, uh, they're trying to save some of the same uh, uh, buildings, but now it's going to have a, a, a Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster inside of it type thing. But so, you know, repurposing things that are on property were considered, well, we do this at Disney, and this is a, uh, you know, uh, this is also what the, the Disney term is always cost efficient. This, this is more cost efficient, you know, uh, uh, to, to do this. And uh, uh, also this was going to be an intimate, exclusive experience mm -hmm. because the, uh, they were reformatting um uh the lodgings there to to accommodate up to maybe 900 people at a time which which really isn't a lot when you when you think of how many thousands of people <laughs> go into right. each of the theme parks every day ha having a having an experience where you know it's only 900 people supposedly and and, uh, and correct that, me if I'm wrong but but wasn't the the ratio going to be one instructor or supposed to be one instructor for every 15 guests so it was yes. definitely meant yes. to be a, a small yes. program yeah yeah and and, and again that be, that became a a, a, a problem a, a, again you know you, we we talked uh, about uh, there wasn't one reason why the disney institute uh, failed and went belly up there there were a lot one of them was that yeah the the classrooms were designed uh for about 15 uh, students, but it never occurred to any of the money people that, wait a minute, even if you have a full class, even if you drag in a couple of extra chairs, like we, we did in the, the final years of the Institute, we, we drag in a couple of extra chairs to try and push it to, to 20 or 25, there's still not enough money there to cover the cost of the instructor uh, the cost of the assistant. There, there was a, an assistant in every program, so that everybody got personal one-on-one -on -one experience. So that while the main instructor was was talking or setting something up, the assistant could go and you know sort of look over your shoulder and say, "Why don't you just move this this way?" <laughs> or why don't you know? Or here, let me help you. You know, get this. And then there was also a, a prep and cleanup crew that that would come in and set up. Uh, the room. So in animation, they would come in and they, they would set up the, the cell paints and the paintbrush and the, uh, the, the cell and, you know, the, the, uh, the index cards you needed for the bouncing ball flip book and, and things like this. And then at the end of the class, uh, they would come in and they would clean all this stuff up. Plus, your overhead includes the utilities. It, it includes those materials, which really didn't come cheaply because you're you're trying to get you know the top of the line stuff because part of the thing is well I'm taking this class and when you leave you take this with you you take your painted cell with you you take uh the meal you made in gourmet uh, cooking you take it with you you know either to eat uh, uh for your lunch or dinner or if it was cookies or something like that take it take it back you know, to to your room. So, you know, this becomes very pricey. And my gosh, you know, uh, uh, having only 15 people in a class, and and each class lasted about two to sometimes three hours. And there would be a, a class in the morning, then there'd be the two-hour lunch break, and then there would be a class in the uh, afternoon, and then there would be a two-hour dinner break, and then right after dinner there would either be a, uh, a performance in the performance center or, or something in the uh, 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 cinema. And but, so the whole concept was, too, is, well, people will be living right here on and, property, so all they have to do is walk to these places, and it's a whole immersive, you know, full-day experience. And, in, and in fact, immediately they started selling three, four-day, and seven-day, you know, things. Three days was minimum. 
But and, and, again, and, and that's what I say. Like to be clear, this was very much positioned. You were talking about the financials. This was very much positioned as a premium experience. This was not, at least at the beginning, you could walk in and take a class. This was, you need to stay for a minimum of three days to a week. It's going to cost you anywhere from 500 to $14, which, you know, ballparking the numbers is probably about 900 to $3,200 per person for this stay. And look, on paper, Jim, you know, before we start to, oh, you know, and, and, on paper, and, and, and it could, it could, it could go higher than a thousand dollars, and and we're talking nineteen ninety six money here, right? Uh, it it could go higher than a thousand dollars, depending upon what accommodation you had, uh, the time of year, and 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 uh, this was another problem too, which killed things, is they were constantly shifting the uh, the the price point, so uh, so you weren't clear as to you know well i'll come back next year but i don't know how much that's gonna gonna cost me and then what happened because they were they were so desperate to fill the classes is they got to the point where it was you didn't have to stay on property because again they were getting real pushback because the premium price was was like about the same price that you would get at the Grand Floridian or the Boardwalk or whatever, but you weren't getting the same amenities. But but on you know? paper and, you and were. Fact, but I, I think they... on, but I think what, I think on paper and and this is was maybe where the disconnect was. On paper you were. So let's sort of just backpedal for one second. You were talking about the expanding of the buildings and things like that. They built and created a lot of amenities for guests. So that original Buena Vista Golf Club. They triple the size of the building that's there. That's a welcome center. It's a check-in center. They have a, a its own unique gift shop called the Dabbler. They had a, a relaxation. And actually, it was Dabblers with it with an S at the end, because basically it was named after the fact that guests were coming and they were dabbling in unfamiliar disciplines, and Dabblers were selling exclusive pricey upscale merchandise that was related to the classes that right. guests could right. take. So, you know, if, if you were uh, going into the gardening class and you're taking the topiary class and making a Mickey Mouse topiary, you could go into dabblers and you could buy wire frames for, uh, you know, other, other uh, uh, characters, but it, it was a premium price, you know, and, uh, yeah, I, I I know online they refer to it as dabbler, but it was dabblers because <laughs> because I was there, <laughs> gosh darn it! And uh, I I also had to take care of uh, dealing with the animation uh, uh, stuff that was being uh, uh, sold uh, through there, and they had how to draw books and things things like uh, uh, that. But but you were saying you know it it. It tripled in size. Yes, you got that check-in desk. You got dabblers. Right, there's a and what a else gather- did you have, Lou Mangiello? <laughs> what else did you have in that Buena Vista Golf Club building? They had the Gathering Place Lounge. They had yes, a which had a grand piano, and Judson Green would come there at hmm. night and play on the piano. I, I don't know if people remember Judson Green. He was being groomed to take over for. Michael Eisner, and as soon as he realized that Michael Eisner wasn't going, there, <laughs> right. uh, Judson Green went somewhere. But Judson Green, uh, again, like a like a Frank Wells, if you met him in person, wonderful, wonderful human being that really cared about people, really cared about the guests, really cared about cast members. Very smart, very sharp. Um, but again, Disney disposes of these people. So yeah, you, you've you've got that lounge, and so so you've got these nice uh, uh, puffy chairs and uh, and uh, 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 couches and, and, and things things like that. And and uh, you know you could also get uh, a, a drink, and so you know uh, they kick back there, you know, in in luxury, and I'm having this little drink here while I'm you know. Uh, thinking about, you know, philosophically, you know, life and, and the classes I took today and all that. So and there's also the right, so lounge was outside of what? The, the restaurant. They had a full-service restaurant called Seasons, which, mm-hmm. again, 
as if you if you were to read it, they would have a themed menu that changed every night. The mm-hmm. problem, and I never ate there, but the problem, from what I understand, is that the the concept was wonderful, but the execution wasn't because it wasn't necessarily the quality of the food wasn't up to par with some of the nearby restaurants, including the ones that were at the you know the the village next door. And that and that, well, that was ba- close first. Right? That was Seasons the first was called Seasons because there were four dining rooms. So it was related, and each dining room related to one of the four seasons. And there were murals painted on the wall and all that. And, and actually the food was, was, was pretty uh, uh, upscale. Um, but again, the, the problem with uh, the menu was since it was constantly changing, you found something that was a favorite of yours, and then during the rest of your stay, <laughs> they didn't offer it again, you know? And uh, it, it was also very casual, and part of the problem, and, and Seasons was one of the first things that closed at the Disney Institute, because, you know, people from off uh, uh, Disney Institute property could come and dine at Seasons, but it was difficult to get to the Disney Institute, and then once you got to the Disney Institute, it was difficult to find <laughs> parking, and, and in fact, there were really only about, I'm, I'm trying to remember now, there were maybe 20, 25 parking spots close to where Seasons was. Every other parking spot, you really had to hike, you know, to, to go get, to, get to, to Seasons. And so um, sometimes the food actually was too fancy for some of the guests that, that were there. And uh, other times it was just like, you know, uh, they would do, and, and I hate this at restaurants, is suddenly they would just do this experimental thing, you know. Well, what's this thing over here? It looks like seaweed, and is, is this, you know, a, a rat's tail, and what, what is this over here, you know. Um, but again, you're talking to a guy who grew up on McDonald's Happy Meals. So, you know, my... my um, my culinary expertise and uh, is, is very limited, but um, the food uh, was because I ate there several times. Because oftentimes when we had special guests, and that was one of the advantages of Disney Institute is have a special guests show up. Wh- whether it was you know a, a John Kane maker or Michael Graves the architect or whatever is especially the animation group, we would take them to eat at, at, at Seasons. Ward Kimball, I, I remember it, at, is sitting there around a table. We took Ward Kimball, and he was accompanied by Michael Brogy uh, up there, and we had a wonderful, uh, wonderful evening, and uh, uh, Ward didn't complain about... Uh, uh, actually, <laughs> I was going to say Ward didn't complain about the, uh, the, the food. He, it, there was a dessert there, which was this sort of cream pie and uh, uh ward is is quite up there in in years now you know we're talking 96 97 so um and and he supposedly been happily married to his wife for decades and so he's up there and you know there's a round table and we've we've got the uh uh, animation uh, uh, staff there, and one of the assistants, uh, Mary, who, who was in her uh, 20s, because each of the animation uh, uh, salaried instructors had an assistant to help out in, in each of the classrooms. And Mary had a background uh, at Disney as a cell painter. She was an incredible cell painter, but, you know, she was seeing, you know, th- that job went south. So, so she's a, an assistant there. And she's sitting next to, to Ward Kimball, and Ward's eating, and she says, oh, you've, you've got a, a little bit of cream, you know, on your, your nose. And so she licks the tip of her finger and wipes off the cream on his nose. And uh, uh, Ward's been flirting with her all evening, and he looks down <laughs> at his pie, and he rams his face into the pie, and then turns to Mary to see what she's going to do next. And I love Mary dearly. I love Mary dearly, and she she was the best assistant. We had three assistants that rotated. She was the best assistant I ever had. And um, but Ward and Michael Broger had told us too. Ward's not going to 
do any drawing. He'll he'll sign anything that you have, but he won't do any drawing. And Mary gave him uh, uh, something to sign, and he drew this picture of Mickey Mouse. And the rest of us are there grinding our teeth. But anyway, that's a season story. Um, I, I did get a uh, Mary again. Mary was such a wonderful person. She allowed me to Xerox off, you know, uh, <laughs> that black and white drawing that Ward did. So I have a copy uh, of, of that. But um, yeah, seasons oftentimes got the bad uh, rap of well, the food food's not really good. The, the food was actually uh, uh, quite good, but it was not like what you would get at the Grand Floridian, right. or what you would get at the boardwalk. And again, as I said, after a while, they were so worried about filling classes that you didn't have to stay on property to take the classes. And so people who were rich would stay at um, the Grand Flor- Flor- uh, Floridian or uh, the boardwalk, and then they would drive in. And those people who, like me, you know, really are watching their budget, you know, would stay at a budget hotel and then drive in and take classes. But again, the business profile is you're looking at heads in beds. And so if you're not having people stay at the resort, you're losing money. So you're losing money on the classes. You're losing money on people not staying there. But I think that's Uh, why they I think that's why they built the facilities that they did, because they thought that they were going to be attractors enough. So there was also a mm-hmm. health club and a spa. I don't know what you actually do in those rooms. There was a, a performing arts center, and in, an indoor performing arts center, like 200. The performance arts center was acoustically perfect. It was made so it was acoustically perfect. So uh, there were 225 seats, and if you stood on stage and talked, even in, not with the bullhorn voice that I have, but in, in, a, in a normal voice, you could hear it crystal clear in the last row. And they, they also had these uh, side boxes, which, which were great. So very classy, very luxurious uh, seats. So the uh, performance center was, oh, my gosh. And, and that was oftentimes where they would uh, bring in people for uh, interviews or, or sometimes if you had a, um, a, a solo performer, or a, a magi- like a magician or a singer or whatever, you know, the performance center is, uh, you know, where that would, would very, very classy uh, uh, little location there. And, and again, uh, they started to open up um, the evening presentations to people not staying at the Institute, but people who came in from the outside had to pay uh, uh, to get in. You know, so... Uh, you know, this was before there were magic bands or things like that, but there were ways that you could identify yourself that you were a, uh, an instructor or a, you, know, you were staying at the Disney Institute, whatever, so you could get in. But other people had to pay in order to uh, get in and see the performance there or see it in the cinema, which was uh, 400 seats. And uh, again, state of the art, no balcony. I, I, I thought, my gosh, they should have a balcony here, but they don't. And um, they they would show uh, sometimes first-run films. Sometimes they would sh- show these uh, obscure, confusing little independent films. Uh, but little Jimmy Corcus, <laughs> twice a month, would do a presentation in the cinema on uh, Disney animation. And, and they had the rights to show certain things like like the uh, uh, Mickey Mouse shorts. So I literally d- devised a dozen different programs that centered on different Mickey Mouse shorts. So there was a Halloween show, there was a Building a Better Mouse show, things like that. So uh, and, and those were really, really well attended because, again, people wanted to see Mickey Mouse. They didn't want to see, you know, uh, some of these really depressed depressing feature films which are were really prestigious so i i'm i'm sorry i didn't appreciate them more but you know uh and and again beautiful uh beautiful theater and uh, here's a sad story for you here's a sad story for you uh is um 
both in the performance center and in the cinema is they would tape every performance uh, on documentary tapes. And when the Disney Institute um, ceased to exist, they destroyed every tape. No kidding. Yes. Uh, well, and, and, and in fact, it, it's even worse. You know, when I worked over at the uh, uh, Learning Center at Epcot, that was the dotted line connection to Disney University. Disney University one day um, asked us to send up all of the, these tapes. And I thought, well, this is unusual. This is all Disney history oriented, like an interview with Admiral Joe Fowler and uh, uh, things like this. And, and uh, uh, we sent them up to Disney University. They just and I thought, well, they're trying to make Disney University the center for Disney history, so everybody will go to Disney University first rather than to learning centers. They destroyed every single tape because I was told they didn't have the time and money to transfer it over to DVD, and they were concerned that they didn't have um, uh, waivers to you know uh, allow the rights to, to show those things. So they destroyed all of them. But because again, that was part of the attractor, right? They they had uh, um, announced and then lined up. They had all different types of celebrities and people. Oh come yeah, in. You, uh, is Siskel and Ebert showed up one time. Uh, actor James Earl Andy Jones. Uh, James Earl Jones uh, was, was there a couple of times. In fact, James Earl Jones was on stage and he was reading a story. And on the same stage, you had animator Mark Henn at an animation desk, and he was drawing character designs and things like this to match the story that James Earl Jones was saying and was projected up on this big screen. But again, all of those tapes lost, all of those gone. We, we had, uh, uh, because remember, we also had feature animation uh, Florida out there, and they were working on, on films, and so we had animators come over from... Um, who were working on uh, Mulan and give presentations and uh, visual presentations. And on Fantasia 2000, I, 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 I remember um, uh, uh, seeing some of the rough pencil stuff and all of this, and it's like, oh, wow, oh, 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 oh. you know? And um, so, so the Performance Center and the uh, 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 cinema, just, you know, absolutely wonderful uh, performance uh, uh, spaces and uh, the and then afterwards, right? the the and then afterwards, seasons was was still open, so you could go up there and get a drink or get a little, you know, dessert or whatever. You know, but the thing, the the performing area that didn't work, the outdoor <laughs> amphitheater. <laughs> you know, you, you, it, it was over a thousand seats, but they never put a cover over it. Huge mistake. You know, because it rains in Florida. You've got the hot Florida sun. I remember uh, uh, even that opening week, we were, we were sitting out there because they were doing a, a, an opening uh, presentation. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, seated there on, on one of the uh, uh, benches, and it's like I'm covering my eyes, and it's like I can't see the stage. <laughs> And I have sweat dripping down, you know. Uh, and uh, we, we had these purple polo shirts uh, with, with blue uh, highlights. And it had, you know, uh, Disney Institute embroidered on it. And I'm, I'm sweating through this. And I'm, I'm going, I'm glad they gave us three of these because I'm going to have to go change before I go teach, you know, uh, for this, this to happen. But they didn't want to put a cover on it because it was like, you know, but it looks so pretty like this. Yes, oh, we were saying, but you can't use it. <laughs> right, it was like the the America Gardens Theater in Epcot w originally mm -hmm. didn't have a cover over it. And 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 the amphitheater now, if you go to Saratoga Springs, the amphitheater now is now an outdoor pool because yeah, they realized we can't do this. <laughs> um, you know, and and we were talking about. Um, classrooms there were 28 classrooms that were built and uh most of them were in a two-story building which was right across uh from the uh uh, uh the uh, uh 
health and fitness center, which, which again was part of the extension later to uh, uh, the golf club there. It was just on the uh, uh, other side of uh, 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 seasons there. And uh, boy, that, that was magnificent. You know, it, it two stories. It had a full basketball court. It had an indoor pool. It had, uh, you know, it, it, it had that, it had that uh, spa where you could get a seaweed facial or aromatherapy. You know, uh, they, they had the fitness center with all of those, you know, uh, devices that I always tell myself I'm going to get on one day and, and, <laughs> and use and, and never do. Um, you know, uh, and so most of the classes were in that uh, two-story uh, building. The animation classes were all on the uh, uh, bottom uh, uh, floor. And, uh, and here, once again, you know, we, we, we've, we've got a classroom where we're dealing with clay animation. They didn't put in a sink in the classroom. <laughs> so we had to send people out of the classroom and down the hall to go to the bathroom, you know, to wash their hands and all. <laughs> Let me get my grumpy old man cane waving in the air. But uh, there was also another classroom section uh, that was away from that that, that held the uh, TV studio and the radio station. And again, those were classes people could take, you know, about video production and radio production and uh, be a DJ and, and, and things like that. And it was in the same building that held the uh, culinary uh, studio where they had, you know, a huge kitchen and you could make yourself a gourmet Chinese meal or something like that. And um, that was also the design arts uh, studio. Design arts was, um, uh, I remember one class that I took because as, a, as an instructor, they encouraged you to take these classes for free so that you knew what was going on so that you could then, you know, uh, shill it to the guests, you know. Well, you know, if you liked painting that cell, you might want to go over to the design arts thing because they have this class called faux painting where where you can, you know, uh, uh, do up uh, uh, this design so it looks like wood or it looks like marble and all that and save you a ton of money and the, the, the whole whole bit, you know. Um and so, uh, you know, I was there, as I said, opening crew. And on opening day, I was there where, and I've told you this before, Michael Eisner stood in front of all of us and he said, look, I understand that this is a new and unusual concept. I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm fine with the fact that it's probably not going to make any money for the first uh, 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 three years, you know, I'm going to support any losses because it's going to take, you know, word of mouth, uh, uh, to build this up because even though it opened in beginning of February 96, we had been doing soft opening classes all through January for, uh, selected, uh, cast members. And, uh, there were dozens of travel writers for magazines and newspapers that had come in and, and it helped us shake down, you know, the classes, but it also gave them an idea of, oh, look at this. This is different. So anyway, Michael Eisner up there saying, you know, by golly, you know, uh, I'm going to uh, support this. And, you know, I'm thinking, my gosh, I've, I've got a, a, a job for, for life, you know, because this is, uh, at that time, it was the best job I'd ever had in my entire life. It, it, looking back on it now, it was the second best job. Uh, first best was working with Disney Adult Discoveries, the behind-the-scenes uh, tour things. But anyway, Michael Eisner is saying that, and we're all, oh, my gosh, this is great. Within six months, classes and staff were cut. So there were classes like uh, genealogy research, uh, spiritual inquiry, I'm sure you would have wanted to take that. Power, babysitting, money management, gone. And that just began this whole thing of... Bum, 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 bum. Because when the Institute opened, you had 80 different classes in nine different program tracks. You know, But within the first year, by 1997, a lot of these program tracks you know, uh, were completely cut. They had a program track called Story Arts. And they had classes like uh, storytelling journeys and as Walt would tell it. So as Walt would tell it was it was a, a class uh, about uh, Disney animated films and how Disney goes about 
you know, taking a, a classic uh, fairy tale and making it into a film and storytelling elements in an animated film. Excuse me. Storytelling elements in an animated film. And the lead instructor for that class and the guy who developed it was an Imagineer by the name of Charlie Kurtz, K-U-R-T-S. And uh, Charlie had worked on the creation of the Splash Mountain attraction. And if I had been a little sharper and not so busy worrying about trying to get my animation classes together, I should have sat down and really interviewed him uh, because uh, I was cross-trained into teaching that uh, that class, as Walt would uh, tell it and charlie uh, charlie was great in terms of being a mentor of, of getting me me through that but i remember the head of the story arts department you know in front of me goes he's not a storyteller he's just an actor and i said <laughs> oh gosh I'm, I'm sorry because this guy had won storytelling awards and was a member of storytelling organizations and and whatever but Management needed a backup in case Charlie got sick, you know, or Charlie was needed somewhere else. You know, Jim Corcus could be trotted out and, and, and teach that class and, and do a, a, a competent, solid job uh, uh, of it. But, you know, by 1997, that whole department gone. You know, it's like, what? And we should, and I want to, just so people understand, Jim, because when I think we're talking about the Institute and the programs that are there. Because again, as some, as a kid who was so excited for this concept and wanted to go and wanted to take these classes, like I want to, I want to sort of go through those programs and classes. So people have an understanding of what was there, because I wonder to this day, and we can sort of touch on this as we wrap up, but I wonder if this concept, if, if properly executed today would be incredibly would work popular today. Ab- absolutely. absolutely. In, in, in fact, the line that everybody, including the staff that worked there, started using the second year uh, and was used right up until its closing is, you know, everybody has great ideas of how this concept could work, except the people running the Institute. Right. <laughs> And, and, and again, part of that was because of the people who were se- selected. You know, uh, Richard Hutton actually came from um, uh, public television in uh, uh, Washington and, and, and New York, Washington, D.C. and New York. And the staff that he created came from that same uh, milieu. So none of them were immersed in the Disney culture. So let's talk about some of the actual programs that were available. And these changed throughout the years. They expanded, they shrunk down a little bit, and certainly at the end, there were far fewer than at one point when there were upwards of almost 80 different programs in nine different program tracks. And again, the names changed, the content changed, but for the most part, I want to give you an idea of just some of what was available and how and why. I I think, from a personal perspective, it was so very exciting, so In the animation program category, there was an animation production workshop, which was a two-hour workshop where we would work alongside an actual animator, like a Jim Corcus, and create little film clips. You'd learn drawing techniques, things like uh, squash and stretch. There was a clay animation one, a computer animation one, which again, at the time, was relatively groundbreaking, just learning how to animate a, a ball bouncing up and down. You could discover animated characters, which is you'd learn about the process of Disney animation and actually paint an animation cell, as well as Disney character drawing, the importance of Disney character and tre- integrity when creating a, a character like Mickey or Donald, or really any character, the, the importance of character and integrity is critical. There were also a number of culinary programs, which makes 2018 Lou Mangiello both happy and sad that he didn't, didn't get a chance to do it. There was Taste of the World, where you could order, you can uh, try your hand at preparing dishes that offered culinary tours through specific regions of the world. There was a celebration of Southern living style, pastries and confections, the art of healthy cooking, wine, wonders, and song, which, which, which had food and wine pairings along with a professional chef. Advanced wine appreciation, the art of wine blending, and a sommelier would actually come in and help you improve your ability to not just order but really evaluate wine 
and then learn how to prepare romantic dinners for that special someone or someone's in your life. There was a number of gardening programs in terms of designing gardens. So things that you can, not only you could take back home with you, the basics of garden design, color and texture and theming and how to choose just the right plants. The creative gardener would talk about things like window boxes, trellises, water ponds, container gardens and more the wonders of plants and herbs and, and the cultures of roses, gifts from your gardens, living off your own land, a little nod to living with the land, and topiaries, which were obviously very, very popular because of the number of topiary creations that guests could see throughout the Walt Disney World Resort. In the great outdoors, I don't mean the John Candy and Dan Aykroyd movie, there was a golf clinic, rock climbing, and a tennis clinic there was a track of photography programs, including better home videos. Now, again, think about when this was. Home video was not just about content consumption, running out to blockbuster video and renting movies, but more importantly, people were documenting and creating their own. There was outdoor photography, exploring photojournalism, candid portrait photographies, and travel photography. As you traveled through World Showcase in Epcot, they would have a photographer teaching you and how to photograph the architectural and the horticultural details. One of the things that really got me excited that I, I really uh, unfortunately never got to do were some of the television programs. So there was a three hour television on location program where you could cover the news, create a short documentary or direct sort of a, a little mini ABC after school special for broadcast on the Disney Institute internal TV channel. There was also the television studio live, we would learn how to become an anchor person, an audio tech, a camera operator, or even a director as you'd go on the air with the news for that same internal Disney Institute TV channel because it was a closed circuit TV station, DITV, as well as the WALT radio station. Now, there was also a number of youth programs, and these were really gauged between the ages of, there was a 7 to 10 program and an 11 to 15 program. And now this may have actually been both a blessing and a curse because if you were a family that had a child that was eight years old and then had a child that was three years old, well, now you're stuck with that. What do we do with that other child? Because there were no programs here. That being said, from ages seven to 10, they had some amazing and really fun programs. I think we've started to see some of these things come into play with some of the activities they have at the resorts in some of the... the um, the camps that they've had throughout Walt Disney World in terms of uh, places that you can let your kids go on property while mom and dad went and had a romantic dinner. So there was Abracadabra, it's magic. Art Surround, where you could kids would go to Epcot and discover their creative side. Broadway Bound would teach kids how to act, sing, and dance, Disney style. There was Campfire Cooking, I love all the food, Creating Comics, dig that especially now the discovery island kids adventure where they would actually go and visit discovery island for some hiking and some bird watching face magic would teach them how to the the theme park face painting artists would create and transform uh guest faces using um using makeup and then the swamp stomp would take them on a nature safari through the cypress swamps and it really was an environmentality type of thing because they would really learn lessons about how to protect the environment. For kids ages 11 to 15, there was Art and Magic, examining the animation project process, the Discovery Island Explorers, which again, take them over to Discovery Island and uh, watch and help be participatory in some of the live animal shows. The Funny Papers would t learn cartoon secrets for creating comic strips, stealing the show, again, a little bit more advanced in terms of the elements of good show from a Disney perspective. A lot of the things that you see now are taught at the current Disney Institute for businesses and corporations. Showbiz Magic would take kids into the Utilidors to really get one of those early looks behind the scenes at, scenes at creating some of that magic. And then Youth Rock Climbing, which is a two-hour climbing technique um, that would bring them obviously outside to an outdoor rock wall. There was also other programs that came in and out and I think some of these are both fun, funny, and a little intriguing. There was antique treasure hunting, which was so interesting. I would have loved, to, you know, as a, as a kid whose parents owned an antique store and literally traveled the country by car treasure hunting 
as a kid, this would have been interesting to see how that would have translated into a program. I wonder if they would have taken them over into the old antique store in Liberty Square. As Walt would tell it, sort of a, a storytelling and Walt-connected program, aerobics, canoe, canoe exertour, it sounds a lot like exercise to me, DJing, like the DJ handbook, the Disney architecture, I like that one a lot, Imagineer it, where a real Disney Imagineer would help kids design their own theme park attraction. I meet the height requirements, sign me up. Improv interacting, where you'd learn improv by some of the actors at Pleasure Island, like in you'd, you'd go to Pleasure Island. Journal writing, midlife and beyond, not quite sure what that is. Muscle basics, clearly I skipped that one a lot. Painting illusions, puppeteling, self-defense, spiritual inquiry, hmm, and time and organizational skills. Again, I'm going to put uh, videos of some of these programs and some of the testimonials on the show notes page. So if you go to www.radio.com and click on this week's podcast, I'll post some of the videos, the promotional videos that really go a little bit more in depth into these programs. But I love that it was such a, a wide spectrum of programs that I think could meet the needs and the wants and the interests of almost everybody in the family again, as long as they met that seven-year-old age requirement. So I imagine families being able to do things both together as well as individually, and then like a cruise, coming back together for dinner at night to talk about their experiences. Most of these programs were anywhere from two to four or five hours. So it's not like you were taking the entire day out. You could still do some of these programs, enjoy the facilities, go to the theme parks. So you got a little bit of a mix. And I think that's why I was not only disappointed that I didn't do it, but that it hadn't remained and that obviously we don't have the opportunity to do it now and why I still believe it would do very well if positioned and marketed correctly to a 2018 and beyond audience. Uh, But what happened is by 1997, uh, those nine programming tracks had been chopped down to six and, and some of the programs, you know, consolidated. And also in 1997, in order to stop the bleeding uh, from Disney university, they brought in the professional development programs, the magic behind the business. And there was also the hope that professional development would then team with the Disney Institute instructors who they referred to us as trained monkeys, uh, we would offer guests an experience in gourmet cooking, animation, gardening, you know, that type of thing. And then the professional development facilitators would step in and pontificate and make the business connections, you know. You see, when he taught you how to draw a Mickey Mouse there, you know, notice how the directions were clear, and that's what you need to do in your business, you know, the data. Uh, and boy, they just hated being there because uh, being at Disney University had been prestigious. They had better accommodations, things like that. And they knew they were being brought in to be a band aid for a dying project. They also brought in the Disney Adult Discoveries, that's the uh, backstage tours like Backstage Magic, Hidden Treasures, of World Showcase, Innovation in Action. And then they brought in the uh, uh, Disney University Wonders program that got renamed Yes. Mm -hmm. which is youth education series. And, um, you know, uh, but by 97, uh, and and again, when we talk about, well, these are classes, there there were no tests, there were no grades, there was no homework. And basically we had um, designed the classes so that they would be as foolproof as possible so that every single guest, despite their abilities, when they left that classroom, they had had a successful experience. Now, some were more successful than others, but everybody was successful. But we locked it down so it was almost like, you know, there's a little wiggle room, but this works. And I I, I think when you asked me to talk about this, I said, remind me to tell you about the computer animation program uh, uh, incident. So I'm going to do that now, and then we'll talk about the program tracks and the different classes in each uh, of those program tracks. What happened, and, and some of your listeners may, may be familiar with that uh, story, that Disney, of course, has a target on their back for people who want to sue and, and, and all of that. And, 
And so the the famous story, of course, was, was that woman who went to the living seas, and then when she exited through, you know, the hydrolators, uh, she sued Disney because she said it 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 came back up to the surface so quickly that her ears popped, and <laughs> she so she's bends, suing right? Disney. She got the so, so Disney <laughs> let this go to court, and they invited the judge and they invited the jury to come down to the exit of the Living Seas, and they opened the doors, and then they opened the doors <laughs> the side so they could walk straight through. So they saw that once you were in the hydrolator, you know, all of those things bubbling up the side and all that, all of that was just an illusion, you know? You, you were on, on that uh, uh, level. Um, so anyway, uh, I taught every class. I even taught computer animation. And, and Lou, you and I have been friends for I don't know how long, um, since dinosaurs walk the earth, I guess. But you know I am not Mr. Technology. You've been over to my house to help me, you know, set, set up things, you know, and 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 even I think a the dinosaurs plug are will still con- roaming the even earth. a plug will confuse me, you know. Where do I put this? Over in the wall, Jim. <laughs> this is too slow. Oh, okay. So I'm not Mr. Technology, but I was teaching computer animation because in the computers we locked it down. So so we had a wireframe figure, and we had to lock it down because. Uh, as uh, Steven Siegel, uh, who came out, and not the actor, but this is an animator, and he worked on Toy Story, um, he came out a- a- as a guest speaker, and he spent time in the animation classrooms uh, with us. He was telling us funny stories about um, Toy Story that, you know, when you're dealing with computer animation, you know, it's not like hand-drawn animation. You have to tell the computer to move every single thing. And so in... in, in uh, uh, one of the scenes uh, with Buzz Lightyear in um, uh, Toy Story, uh, Buzz lifted his head, but the programmer had forgotten to, you know, tell the eyes to move. So Buzz Lightyear raises his head, and he's got these two blinking eyes floating on his chest because, you know, they had those wireframes had to be hooked into the other wireframe. So... Anyway, we hooked in all the wireframes together so that people could still manipulate, you know, have the character move, you know, raise his hand, things like that. Da, 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 da. And again, it's a two-hour class, so how badly could I, I screw this up, right? And so uh, I, had, I had more ability and more success in the other classes, but sometimes they had to pull in little Jimmy Corcus to, to fill in because there was not a computer animator there at the time. And uh, so if it, if it was that simple that I could do it, you know, m- most guests could do it. Well, what happened is suddenly the animation department, we get called into the office in a group. Apparently there was um, uh, this teenage kid who had taken the class. He wanted to be a computer animator, all of this, and he had written on his website, that he had taken the computer class at Disney uh, Institute. He had created a bug figure, and the instructors said, this is just marvelous, and that figure was later used in A Bug's Life, (laughs) and all he was given was a Disney Institute uh, uh, T-shirt. And and so you can imagine what the comments were, you know, Disney stealing from this teenager, and this is intellectual property, and 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 even though the guests signed waivers, and, and you know that's what, that's why they didn't need to destroy those documentation ta- tapes, because I was a I was a presenter. I knew every time I presented, I had to sign a waiver that Disney could use that material anywhere they wanted, any way they wanted. You know, um, so you know, and it was like. So we had to defend that, no, there is no possible, and we had to bring in people to show them, there is no possible way you could create anything on that computer, and certainly not within the time limit of the class. (laughs) But but again, Disney has this huge target, you know, on on its back, and so that's why I'm very forgiving when Disney, you know, says, hey, wait a minute, (laughs) 
you know, we can't do this. We're worried about this. So do you want to know what the program tracks were for the last, oh, gosh, this was from 97 to about 99. These were the program tracks, and then they made another big cut because in 98, that's when, that's when they started laying people off. They laid me off. They laid off Paul Noss, who was in animation. He absolutely excellent. He, he later moved to um, uh, San Francisco and started doing animation for Vegas slot machines. I didn't even know there was such a job. But, but basically in Las Vegas, they're dealing with some people who don't speak English, so they have a little screen with animation that shows a character, you know, going through, and Paul created this little monkey character. It shows the, you know, if you put in one coin and you win, you get this, but if you put in five coins and you win, you get, look, the whole monkey is covered with coins. Um, so they uh, it laid off a couple of the assistants, and it, it, it was just a sad time. But from 97 to 99, because the Institute closed in 2002, um, these were the program tracks, and these were the classes uh, that you could take. So it, either go out and get yourself a cup of uh, cocoa right now or whatever, or, or, or go, wait a minute, oh, wait, that sounds great. Okay, the animation track. Okay, you had animation sampler, and I, I, I taught that. It, it, it was uh, you painted cells. Uh, you uh, put together a little flip book of the uh, bouncing ball. Uh, animated Beginnings, which is a class that I created, which was the history of um, animation. So you made little animated toys of, of, of how did people do animation before, um, you know, motion picture cameras existed. So you did a thaumatrope, which is a, a little disc that has like a, a cage on one side and a bird on the other, and it's got got strings and you twirl the uh, strings and if you do it right you see the bird in the cage uh did finicistoscopes which is a, a disc that has little slots in it and you can draw a person moving and you hold it up to a mirror and you spin and you look through the slots a zoetrope uh, 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 strip and uh things like that so i was the only one who, who taught that class because i i loved animation history and nobody else did uh, Voices of Disney, and I, I again I created that class and was the uh, uh, instructor for that. Paul uh, Nas uh, would come in and and uh, cover for me. He was my backup on that. Um, and so you would uh, teach people the different voice placements because I've I've done professional voiceover work. I had done professional voiceover work in in, uh, uh, in California. I'd done it for the American Medical Association for one of their uh, uh, puppet shows. I'd done some independent animation, things like that. So the voice placements, and uh, then you record people. You know, you have these little sides. Uh, uh, sides is one sheet of paper that has the dialogue on it, and you record the people. And, and again, they leave with a copy of the tape of them, you know, doing these voices. Uh, classical animation, where you learn how to draw a character, not just the standard Mickey Mouse or whatever, but Winnie the Pooh, things like that. And you also did the bouncing ball, but instead of doing it on the flip book, you drew it on animation paper, and then you filmed it underneath the camera so you could see the ball bounce, you know, back and forth. Uh, computer animation, which, again, you know, you talk a little bit about computer animation, how it's done, how it's wireframe, how you connect things together. And uh, clay animation, which was stop motion, which is where, you know, you have uh, people at three different stations and they're creating their characters and, and they film, you know, one frame at a time, uh, you know, their characters, uh, uh, moving and, and we'd have celebrities come in too. And when I was teaching clay animation, um, uh, Glenn Close came in and, and, uh, one of her handlers came in before she came into the class and she said, do not look at Miss Close. Do not talk to Miss Close unless she talks to you. You know, keep a, a, a keep the the other guests away from Miss Close. And, and and she came in with her her boyfriend and and her um, uh, one of her children. And um, maybe she only has one child, but uh, she came in with one child. And uh, the sweetest person in the entire world. And I said, 
we'll have a special table for you just over here. Said, no, no, I want to be. And, and she wanted to be with the other guests and, and do this. And she talked with them. And oh, oh my gosh. Um, uh, the other, uh, next program track was culinary arts. And the classes you could take was uh, taste of the world. Uh, wine wonders and song, healthy cooking, romantic dinners, culinary technique, uh, studio bakery, uh, celebrations, which is like, you know, birthdays, things like this. You won't find this information anywhere on the Internet, anywhere else. Sometimes you'll, you'll find somebody saying, oh, you know, I went to uh, Disney Institute and I took such and such a class and it was a lot of fun and I went back the next year and it wasn't there. Uh, programming track, home, garden, and great outdoors. So that brought in some of the, um, the, the design arts classes. So you had uh, painting illusions, you had Disney architecture, you had the canoe adventure where you actually went on a canoe, you know, through, through the waterways there of Walt Disney World and saw alligators and all of that. Uh, traveling gardener, topiary creations, which is like the most popular class because you could make a sphagnum moss, a uh, little small Mickey Mouse, you know, 12, 24 inches high, I guess. You know, you could make your own little Mickey Mouse topiary. Gifts from your garden, container gardener. Then you had communication, arts, and entertainment. That, that, that was the film and uh, photography and radio. So you had an edit workshop, outdoor photography, uh, DNN studio production. Um, DNN is uh, Disney Network News there. Uh, exploring photojournalism, computers, uh, learning the Internet, uh, digital imaging, uh, field production, candid portrait photography, DJ, uh, DIDJ, uh, desktop publishing. Then you had uh, uh, sports and fitness, which would have um, uh, aerobics, golf, several golf classes, you know, uh, uh, tennis, several different tennis classes, dance, dance, dance. Uh, aerobics, rock climbing. Rock climbing was huge. They had a rock climbing wall there. I never did that because uh, I'm a wimp. And um, But again, you know, they have all the harnesses. They have all the safety things. If somebody got stuck up there, they'd climb up and get you and bring you back down. Um, strength training, uh, relaxation techniques, self-defense, water exercise. And then the final programming track was what was called Camp Disney. That was the youth programs for those people who were 10 years old and older. And, and I taught uh, some of those. I, I was brought in uh, to teach, uh, you know, the animation generation uh, 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 class and uh, uh, a couple of others. Uh, because, again, I, I, I was a, a certified teacher, you know, in Los Angeles. So I had that background working with with younger kids, and I had that uh, expertise. So they had showbiz magic, swamp stomp, which they took you out into the swamp, the funny papers, which was the cartooning class. I, I uh, occasionally taught that. Art magic, Broadway bound, wildlife adventure, youth rock climbing, Discovery Island explorers, uh, Disney Island kid venture, tiles, temples, and treasure, stealing the show, face magic, that's where you painted uh, your face. So. Uh, you see people running around on property, you know, with their face like a, a, a leopard and uh, things like that. DI Art Lab, Art Surround. And, and so uh, for, for about three years, those, those were the core uh, programs. But what was happening is, um, uh, you know, they, they tried to do things. Like they tried to encourage more attendance because they'd have special – uh, $49 for one day. You could come in and you could take, you know, two classes. And they hoped, oh, well, once people took these, then they'll, well, people didn't want to come ba back in. You know, you were talking about the the prices. Uh, at, at one point, the prices could range from $582 to uh, $1,986. And you don't get to see Mickey. And they won't provide you transportation over to the parks, you know. Uh, another reason why I think you know all of this uh, uh, started to to go south, you know, and they they started to cut back and cut. And what was very sad was the last year, you know, we started with ten animation instructors. The last year, there were only two. 
uh, Locke Wolverton and Phil Ferretti. And Locke Wolverton, when he got let go in 2002, and and this guy was was the most gentle guy in the world, you know, uh, extremely talented, had a huge animation background, and he had been convinced, you know, to come out you know, to Florida for this class, and he figured he was going to run out the rest of his life just teaching there at the Disney Institute. And when the Disney Institute laid him off, he had to, he's stuck out here in Orlando, and he's got to struggle to try and find, you know, freelance work, you know, and he'd been out of the business for, um, well, since 96. So, you know, uh, people come and go. And so, you know, it's difficult to do that when you don't have connections. Very uh, bitter. But, you know, uh, Disney goes, well, we're just, well, we're cutting those classes. And what was very sad is I, I, I stayed on good terms with him uh, even when I was laid off because they would keep calling me back to do the uh, annual animation event that, that was run on property where you'd bring in people for uh, two weeks and in the gymnasium <laughs> in the gymnasium you set up the animation tables and different sections and all this and you divided people into different groups and they created their own animated film and so the last year 2002 uh, it was um, uh, drawn to be bad Disney villains drawn to be bad was, was the theme and so they were each given uh, the apple, which was, you know, the, the witch's Snow White's apple. And that was the first image in your, in your segment, in your sequence. And it was the last in your sequence. So you started from that apple, and then you had to storyboard and create your own story, but then it had to come back to that apple. So then you could cut together all those different uh, things into one, you know, a uh, solid cartoon. It, it was great. People uh, and we brought in uh, people like oh, uh, Jeff Curdy. We brought in uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Joe Ramph. Oh, I love Joe Ramph. He uh, came out and and uh, talked. And so uh, we had all of those uh, people going, ah, rah, 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 rah. you know, get back on track, Jim. So anyway, uh, the last year, two thousand two they started closing down the studios, you know, to try and save overhead. So they had already closed down uh, much of the culinary things, so they moved the animation desks over to the culinary studio and set that up, you know? And it was just so sad because there wasn't the extra bells and whistles, you know, that that, that, that you could, could use. But... <laughs> But, uh, you know, basically it, it became, you know, fewer guests were signing up for the classes, fewer were staying at the resorts, so the classes were eliminated or consolidated. Uh, and the other factor involved is that we're talking 2002 here. Actually, 2000 is where you really saw the death knell. You know, 1998, you know, you've got another set of massive cuts, but it limped on, and then about 2000, you're starting to see, well, we're offering less enrichment classes and more of the pricey uh, professional development classes. Uh, at that time, uh, Eisner was under siege, you know, and so he's not going to stick his neck out and try and save the Disney Institute. He's got too many other uh, irons, you know, in the fire to, to try and take care of. And also, uh, there were people at uh, Disney who did not care for Michael Eisner. And they saw that this was uh, Michael's, uh, uh, one of Michael's pet projects. And so what can we do to undercut this so that we can literally show that, you know, look how wrong and bad Michael Eisner was. So, you know, that, that played a factor into it as well. And the fact that, that you've alluded to, which was, um, you know, you're coming out to Walt Disney World and you're not going to go play at the parks. You know, I, I taught some of the, the youth programs because they got offered to um, uh, school classes that came uh, to Disney to visit. And those were some of the hardest classes in the world for me uh, to teach because I'm sitting in this room 
with middle schoolers, and they had been told they were going to come to Walt Disney World, and they're sitting in this classroom with this old man, <laughs> and, and, and the parks are just literally minutes away. And so it's like, how long do we have to stay here until we can go to the parks? You know? And I think, but, and I, think the, I think that's uh, I think the biggest part of the problem, Jim, was not necessarily what Disney Institute was doing or financials or cutbacks. I think it was two things. I think one was an awareness issue. I think that they wanted and expected this to grow via word of mouth faster than it did or or, or was. Mm -hmm. And I think and as a from a guest perspective and having conversations with my parents about it. I was excited to go because I was a nerd and I wanted to learn from the people who were creating this place that drew us back every year. But I also didn't want to spend time away from my family and my family didn't want to go and sit in a classroom. And I think that's at, at the heart of it is people didn't want to learn while they were on vacation, especially kids or even adults who were stuck in offices, didn't want to go back into a classroom and all the discounts that they offered and those $49 preview days and all the other incentives didn't do anything to change the perception of what that was. It suffered from the, the part of the issue that Epcot was getting for a while in terms of identity, which was Epcot's the educational park. I'm right. on vacation. I don't want education. Um, it eventually... You know, like you said, they cut the programs and everything is getting cut, cut, cut. And then at some point they realize that this that this model is just not going to work smartly. Disney takes some of the instructors and their courses and they put it into a book, which is a, if you're a, a, a business person, entrepreneur, the Be Our Guest, Perfecting the Art of Customer Service mm -hmm. is a phenomenal book. But now they've got all of this investment of these villas and these new buildings, how do they go and they recoup this? Well, I think it's obviously a, a, a twofold process. They, they change the focus of the Institute from being something for families to something for business professionals. And I think giving them this concept of peeking behind the curtain from Disney's secrets of culture and customer service leads to what we have today for the Disney Institute, which is training for businesses. It takes place in places backstage, not just in classrooms, but backstage and on stage areas. Well, you know, when the Disney Institute closed, that was the Disney spin. The official announcement was the Disney Institute is so successful, it cannot be limited to one physical location. The entire property is the living classroom. And by changing, and they, took, and they took the professional development people and they shoved them over into cubicles over at uh, uh, Celebration, um, and uh, uh, you know uh, they really cut the Disney Adult Discoveries uh, program. They kept some of the uh, uh, classes and transferred that over to uh, Disney University, and the uh, youth classes now connected with that uh, uh, to the S programs. Uh, with that, but yeah, you know, so successful it cannot be, you know, uh, contained in one. You know, but, one but of the things that the was focus... a great advantage about the Disney Institute is people felt that now they could have that personal connection. You know, and as an animation instructor, I got that all the time. People who are taking those classes because it's like, I want to be a Disney animator. You know, will you look at my portfolio? Will you? You know, uh, what classes should I be taking, you know, in, in, in school for this and uh, uh, all of that. And, and uh, very similar to when the Disney stores first opened. The Disney stores, I thought, were hugely successful because they really were an annex to the Disney parks. If you were in Iowa or whatever and you went into a Disney store, you could talk to these people and you felt you were still part of, you know, the Disney experience, you know, that they were talking about the parks and they were talking knowledgeably and they, you know, so you would have that connection. And uh, uh, Disney Institute is still, you know, uh, the class is very expensive and 
Yeah, not not only do they offer them here on Walt Disney World property, but they will go elsewhere. I I, I've, I have friends who are uh, professional development instructors, and uh, some of them gone to India, you know, to teach for a couple of days or a week. You know, it's a premium price, and right. it's you know, uh, but, but because, people are interested. How does Disney do it? You know, right? But the what shift is, is now uh, Disney's approach to customer service. What is you know, uh, Disney's uh, 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 approach to uh, uh, people management, you know? But the shift now is not to the consumer and the individual necessarily no, buying no, a ticket. No, not, and not personal enrichment, not right. guest enrichment. Right, it, because now your employer will send you here for, if it's $1,500 a day or a few thousand and, and dollars they'll pick a, And they'll pick up the money, yeah, right. they'll pick up the the. the the cost of that, yeah. And look, like I said, from a from a personal perspective, I, I loved this idea. I wanted to take classes on television, animation, and film, mm-hmm. and, and customer service. Um, I, I understand the reasons why it didn't work, and and over time, you know, unfortunately, a lot of those buildings and the villas were torn down. The treehouse villas eventually they mm-hmm. got the international cast members out. Now it's one of, I think, the most unique places to stay on property but what i want to know is i want to know from you the listener have you ever been to did you ever attend or take any classes or stay at the disney institute the original og disney institute not not today's version i would love to hear your stories or share a photo or share an experience the best way to do it is by calling the voice did you ever take any animation classes from jim corcus and and was he a lot Thinner and he, he had was. more hair and it was dark. <laughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to post in the show notes over at so if you go to www.radio.com, click on the podcast in this week's episode. I'm going to post a couple of those promotional videos that Disney put out to try and encourage guests and families to come to the Disney Institute. And you may or may not find a familiar face in there as well. And of course, I'm also going to link to all of Jim Corcus's books, which you can find on Amazon. Jim, I appreciate you. Yeah, and I had I had uh, two new books come out right before the uh, summer: more secret stories of Disneyland and uh, uh, extra secret stories of um, Walt Disney World, which was the uh, fourth volume in that. You, you would think I had run out of secrets of Walt Disney World, but you know. And and I will say that I've been to Saratoga Springs, and I think they've done a wonderful job. But but when I walk through the property. I still hear the ghosts of Disney Institute, and I look and I go, that, "That's where I taught animation." You know, that <laughs> that's where you know we we would sit out here, you know, and there was a bench here and 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 do this. But I think the concept could still work. You know, I I think the business profile they set up was destined for failure, and and I think they failed to realize the most important thing, which is people could go anywhere to listen to an expert and be taught. or They, they could go to Chautauqua. Chautauqua still exists, for crying out loud. Um, but, uh, you know, they're coming to Disney because they want to know, want to have that Disney connection. You know, uh, there were some people who were really smart. You know, they offered animation... Uh, 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 positions to uh, uh, Disney animators, not one of them wanted it. No one wanted to relocate to Orlando, and those who were already out in Orlando didn't want to take a, a, a chance and, and move over to the Institute because, you know, they were, they were working on um, uh, uh, films. Uh, uh, Mulan w- w- was coming up and uh, uh, all of that, and uh, Lilo and Stitch, you know, was... Uh, in in process, and so it was like, boy, this studio out here, this annex studio out here in Orlando, this is going to exist forever. You know, as long as I keep my nose clean, I can stay out here forever. Why would I go to the Disney Institute? And and I know that for the entertainment track, they offered positions to um, a lot of the people working in uh, Walt Disney World Entertainment. My brother Mike was actually offered. Uh, a, a position in the uh, uh, entertainment arts uh, track, and he turned it down. He said, uh, I talked to him just recently, and he said, yeah, the word out there was, these people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> well, it's too bad, because like I said, I, I think, look, and based on the popularity and the success of 
the backstage tours and people want to learn and they want to learn mm-hmm. from Disney, I think this concept would absolutely succeed. So in addition to letting me know if you've ever been to the Disney Institute, let me know your thoughts. If something like this was brought back, is it something that you might be interested in doing? And if they bring back Disney Institute, I hope they bring back Jim Corcus. And I, of course, will do the same on an upcoming show. I appreciate you so very much sharing your uh, stories and your experiences and your knowledge of the rest in peace Disney Institute. Well, and thank you so much, Lou. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, take this uh, uh, stroll down memory lane. As I said, it turned out that my working at the Institute was the second best job I had ever had in my entire life. Not just the second best job at Disney, but the second best job my entire entire life. And I actually thought, yeah, I was going to uh, 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 live out the rest of my life teaching uh, uh, animation. And the Disney Institute also opened up so many other possibilities. I'm full of stories. I'm full of something. I think it's stories. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, always make sure that you uh, you listen to uh, uh, Lou's uh, uh, po- podcast, you know. So um, may all your Disney dreams come true. <laughs> Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details, sometimes in what you see or what you hear. And if you think you know the answer, you can enter via our online form for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So it's August in Florida. Do the math. It's hotter than normal, and I and a lot of other people are spending more and more time in the oh-so-very-wonderful Disney water parks. And that's where your question brought you last week, because I wanted you to tell me who is the mascot, if you didn't know they had one, of Blizzard Beach. Thanks to the hundreds of you who entered, got this one correct, or were very creative in your answers, but the correct answer that I was looking for is Ice Gator. Ice Gator, like Ice Gator, is the official mascot of Walt Disney World's Blizzard Beach. And he, as part of like the, the backstory of Blizzard Beach, was seen sliding down the slopes of this ski resort as it started to thaw out, which made it become repurposed as a water park. And he, and he also has a niece who I don't think has a name yet. You can find them uh, in statue form over by Tykes Peak and a few other places throughout property. And they've been playing on the slopes ever since. Actually, he was so popular and people seem to latch onto the idea so well that they led to the creation of a mascot for Typhoon Lagoon who's named Laguna Gator. Anyway, I took all of the correct entries, randomly selected one, and again, you were playing for all of my digital products, my 102 Ways to Save Money for Not Walt Disney World book, all seven of my virtual audio walking tours of Magic Kingdom. So if you dig the history and the secrets and the stories, you'll love the audio tours. You can find them both on iTunes and in Amazon. I'm also going to send the winner a new WW Radio vinyl sticker and a pop socket for his or her phone. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Jeffrey Wheaton. So Jeffrey, congratulations. You have I have your address because you use the form and I will get your prize package out to right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. I'm going to keep this one short and sweet because all I want you to tell me is where in the world, as in like the Walt Disney World, you can find Professor Cumulus Isobar. You have until Sunday, August 26th at 11.59 p.m. to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there. Again, you're going to play for all the digital products, the books, the audio tour, the sticker, and the pop socket for the phone. So good luck. Wait, I promise you something else. I want to give you another way to win. Not this prize package, but a special one. Because maybe you're saying like, look, Lou, I'm not a trivia nerd like you. I actually dated in high school, unlike me. Maybe your first visit to Walt Disney World was in 1999. So you have no idea about some of the extinct attractions from the 70s and 80s. So I've got something 
for you, for all of you actually. And so not only can you enter the weekly trivia contest here and this new way to win, but the prize package I'm going to be giving away is going to be different, somewhat unique, calls for a different type of introduction, and maybe sometimes will be even a little special. So on last week's live Wednesday night video broadcast, another reason why you should tune in, I often will introduce and announce new things on the live show. I announced a new type of a giveaway, and if you go to www.radio.com slash giveaway, you can find out how you can enter to win a Toy Story Land backpack prize package. Now, this backpack is not available in any stores. There's also a water bottle, a cooling towel, a WW Radio vinyl sticker, and pop socket, and maybe another surprise inside. And all you need to do to enter is what I've been saying all along, which is help spread the word. It's easy, you can earn multiple entries, and you're also helping the show, so warm and fuzzies all around, right? Again, so go to www.radio.com slash giveaway and always stay tuned to the live show and social. I'm at Lou Mangello on most social. And of course, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash www.radio. More importantly, you should also be part of our Facebook group, which is www.radio.com slash community. Again, go to www.radio.com slash giveaway. Now, good luck on both and have fun on both. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. Don't forget to continue the conversation and more importantly, be part of the community by going to www.radio.com slash community. That is our Facebook group. I want to thank some new members of the WW Radio Nation family, including Rich O'Kane, Melanie and Shane Whitfield, Jessica Graziano, Lisa Ouellette, Chris Payne, Jeffrey Imwald, Dave Harrell, and Christine Tildesley Morrison. I appreciate all of the love and the support. And if you want to find out how you can not only help the show, but get monthly rewards, including scavenger hunts, magic band covers, logo gear. We have a private Facebook group. We do live video group calls and lots more, including early access to special events. Visit www.radio.com support. And don't forget that a portion of your contribution goes to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. If you have a question you want me to answer on an upcoming show, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com, or call the voicemail. Be heard on the air at 407-900-9391. I'd also love to connect with you on social. I am at Lou Mangello on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And don't forget to like the WW Radio page on Facebook at facebook.com slash Radio. Of course, you know I believe nothing beats a handshake and a hug. I'm still working on details for our next meet of the month in Walt Disney World, most likely September 8th or the 15th. I'll also be this weekend in Noblesville, Indiana on Saturday, August 25th at the Indy Disney Meet. And Sunday, I'm going to be speaking at a college in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and then doing a meetup later on that night. You can visit facebook.com slash Radio to find out about those and other events, including other on-the-road events as I travel to speak. And again, if I can come to speak to your conference, your business, to your school, you can visit loumangelo.com. I also still have just a few spots remaining for my Momentum Weekend Workshop, October 6th and 7th in Walt Disney World. We've already announced Dan Cockrell and Ashley Eckstein as our keynote speakers. This week, I'll have a full list of speakers as well as topic sessions. For more information, go to loumangelo.com slash momentum. There you can also find out how I can maybe help you turn that thing that you love into that thing that you do with some one-on-one or small group coaching. Thanks as always to Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider. You know it's who I love because it's who I use and that's why I recommend them. Whether you're going to World, Land, Cruise, Aulani, Adventures by Disney, or any place on this planet, they can help you get the best possible prices. All available discounts at no cost to you. And then don't forget to head on over to celebrationspress.com to subscribe and order back issues to Celebrations Magazine. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. All I ask, though, is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. It is so very important. The best way to grow this community and this family that you have created is by you introducing people to something that hopefully you enjoy the best way to do that is by tweeting out a link that you are listening on twitter or on facebook or instagram or pinterest and if you can take 30 seconds to rate and review the show over on itunes i want to thank some recent reviewers like 
K. Greenon, who says, This is Disney magic to my ears. This is the podcast of Disney podcasts. I've become a major fangirl for Lou and his show. More like a friend girl than a fangirl. Anyway, the passion he has is infectious and, dare I say, empowering. I look forward to the weekly notifications of a new show so I can get my dose of Disney outside the parks. Lou, you said your dream job was to be a member of the Dream Squad. Well, you are. You bring Disney magic to our lives from thousands of miles away and continue to inspire and walk the Walt Walk. Wow. Um, kudos to you. Can't t- wait to see what the future begins. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, Gary Zerulli says, it's outstanding. I've been listening to Lou since the beginning, and it's true because you comment on every post, and I love you for that. He always seems to amaze. The show is alive with facts and fun. If you're looking for a superior podcast, this is it. You don't have to search any further. Stop, download, and sit back and relax as you found the Disney cast that will provide you all you need to know before you go with laughs and insight to the Disney magic. And A Bramble 77 Amber, I love you. You know that the best of all Disney podcasts, Lou is amazing. He's created a community where you can get a little bit of Disney fix from anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what kind of day or week or year you're having. Lou and the box people, that's the community, are always a bright spot in any of life's obstacles. Keep up the great work, Lou. Amber, Gary, Kay Greenan, thank you all so much. But Amber, I say this all the time because I mean it. I just built the clubhouse. You guys are the ones that populate it. You have created this remarkable community that I am blessed and thankful to be able to be part of and pay witness to. Again, thanks to all of you who have rated and reviewed the show. Again, you can search for WW Radio on iTunes or go to www.radio.com slash iTunes for a link and instructions on how to do it. And finally, and most importantly, thank you, thank you, thank you for the ongoing gift that you give me each and every week. And I do hope that this brings a little bit of happiness to you wherever you are and whenever you listen and whatever it is that you do, whether it's for fun, for work, or maybe something that combines the two, don't forget to always put everything you have into everything you do. Thanks again for listening. I hope that this is your best week ever. See ya. Ron Collins from Moline, Illinois. Just got to listen to episode 530 about the top 10 shopping experiences. I asked you asked to uh, about our favorite experiences. Well, the last, our last family PSP road trip that we took a couple of years ago, uh, I had one shopping experience. I had to do one souvenir I had to have, and that was at uh, Morimoto Mori Shop. As you were talking about it, it's your favorite. Uh, I had to get a ghost picture of myself. Uh, it was a great value, great time. Uh, it was no weight at all, hardly. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. And it was right around 20 bucks. And it was one souvenir I had to have and I had to make three at home. So, uh, thanks a lot for the great show you're doing. Uh, I plan on going to the Disney MPB in Noblesville, Indiana. Hopefully I can see you there. Thanks. Hi, Lou. This is Jennifer Lambert from Southgate, Michigan. Uh, I'm just wrapping up listening to show 530, talking about the shopping experiences. And I wanted to comment on uh, your comments about the Disney store. So when I was in college, I worked at one of the Disney retail stores in the mall, and uh, my job was the greeter at the front door. Uh, I was in the era of the uh, the 50s skirts with the with the varsity letter sweater. That was my uniform, and what I was told was to act like Tigger when folks came into the store. Very bouncy, very happy, very uh, joyful and excited. Um, and we were scored on that by secret shoppers at the time. Uh, we were told that our jobs was to make sure people felt the same way coming into the Disney store as they did in the park. And it was a great job, great job to have while I was in college. So just wanted to uh, share with that. Have a great day. Hey, Lou, it's Christine Martin uh, from Flower Town, PA. Swimming here in the ton of rain that we have gotten and thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm, but it is summer, and I'm happy for that. So I just listened to your latest episode with Tim Foster and talking about different your favorite shops around the world. 
I don't have a specific favorite shop, but what I do like to do is I like to roam around and find the most unique wine glass I can find to bring home with me. So that's always something I enjoy because I love my wine. And I, my family, my kids especially, are big pin traders. And so they're constantly going around looking at everybody's pins and trading with cast members and such. But I do it a little differently. I like to find the most unique pin I can find. So I take my time. I go everywhere. And I find pins that mean something to me for that specific trip or in general. So a couple of my favorite ones, I have one from Trader Sam's at the Polynesian, which is my favorite lounge. Got to get the uh, OA. Um, It's awesome. And I got a Fort Wilderness one from where we stayed. I have a Tower of Terror, which is my favorite ride, and that's Mickey and Minnie falling in the elevator screaming, and when you open it, it's Stitch in a bellhop costume, uh, not costume, bellhop uniform, chewing through the cable. So I love Stitch, love Tower of Terror, had to get it. I have the up balloon pin with all the little beads as the balloons, which I loved. I thought was awesome. One of my absolute favorite ones is the pin from the Tomorrowland movie, and I had gotten it from a cast member. It's a cast member pin. It's not the one you can buy when you're down there. That's a totally different pin. I got it. I lost it. I was devastated. And my niece found it for me for Christmas. So that Tomorrowland pin looks just like the one in the movie. It's exactly the same. I love it. Love it. Love it. So that's what I do when I'm down there uh, when I'm shopping. Wine glasses and pins. And um, I love the episodes with you and Tim. Please keep them coming. You guys just crack me up. You have such chemistry. You're just really just brothers. And uh, it, it's so much fun to listen to you. So I'll see you in Latrobe. And have a wonderful, wonderful week. And everybody make somebody smile. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello, Lou Mangiello. It's Darlene Yaggy from West Seneca, New York, calling in with our countdown. Oh, wow. We have 40 days as of tomorrow until our trip to WDW Florida with the Sternbergs. And you have 48 days until that fabulous momentum weekend that I think is now sold out. Then 420 days until the adventure to Japan, which that just looks so amazing. You also have a number of different events coming up now, and those are starting with the um, next meet, which is uh, September 21st, WDW Radio E-Ticket Weekend in Walt Disney World. I uh, wish I could be there for that, but once I move down to Florida, I'll be able to enjoy them. Then you have the October 14th WDW Radio Adventure by Disney to Disneyland in Southern California. That is going to be a lot of fun, everyone, because Southern California is absolutely beautiful and amazing. The temperature is great out there. So have a magical day and talk to you real soon. Love and hugs.